Um, I just want to show you a video. Um, there's a lot of huge amount of documentation of this by the people that produced the project, but also by most of this was documented through people who encountered this event and through social media. So that hashtag was repeated. I've just seen these soldiers at Waterloo Station. What the hell's going on? Hashtag we are here. And so the collective consciousness of this project grew throughout the day. And it started off as confusion and then people you know, built up momentum and more and more people were seeing and encountering this event. So by the end of the day, it was on all the local news and you know, what's this thing that's happening? Um, and it was incredibly kind of successful in creating that reach very quickly through quite simple um, terms. So I'm just going to show you, there's a lot of documentation, but this is the one thing, we were talking about how difficult it is to get attention. Observe the soldiers and the people around the soldiers. photo and then scuffles it off. Did you see her? Mm -hmm. um, the kid, the child pointing, but the adult with the child just, yeah, we don't have time for this, and rushing them off. And so many people just looking at this word, carrying on. You know, this is a really massive visual statement. It's completely incongruous to that place, that time, a hundred years difference. And so many people aren't responding. So you, yeah, you have to work really, really hard um, to get attention. But I think it's, it, it becomes contagious. And so when people break that line and get involved, then other people get involved and ask and, and come up and approach. Um, so but it's this, this you know, combination between the, the physical presence and this digital presence was really, really successful with this project. Um, and it just, yeah, it was a, an act of remembrance that was distributed across all the kind of big towns where these soldiers came from that, that died in that battle. So political, poetic, um, and yeah, I think quite successful. Has anyone come across this project before? Or heard of the artist, Jeremy Della? Did she do something in the north of Ireland? Or am I mixing him up with somebody else? Did he he made, do that parade or something? Yeah, I think he did something with the orange yeah. the parade. The orange, yeah, I, I think I've got a recollection. Yeah. So. so yeah, he often works with it, it kind of politically and historically yeah. significant yeah. events. Yeah. Um, and, kind of, and then his interventions are to try and create conversations and cohesion around yeah. previous points of conflict. Yeah. But I think you know, some of you, I, I get the impression that you, know, you kind of really want to enact change in the environment. Um, and I think, have a look at Jeremy Dedder's first work, because I think that's a great inspiration. I was offended. Um, I think, um, well, we can have a look at the website, but it's, it was well funded. He's, he's an you know, incredibly well established artist who's been you know, shortlisted for the Turner Prize in, in the UK. And, um, and it was a centenary commission for the World War I centenary. Um, let's see about the project. So it would have been Arts Council um, funded. It, would have, it was well funded. Okay, so Paul Hamlin Foundation, which is an arts and education and social change charitable trust, the Art Fund, which is, I think, kind of government and arts council. I um, don't know what Alba is, National Theatre and Birmingham Repertory Theatre. Uh, so you're funded by the, the lottery Lottery's fund. Yeah. So this, it, it, was, yeah, it was very well funded. I think how much, you know, 2,000 World War One uniforms. Training the actors because they, you know, they had to rehearse how they would behave, how they would not interact. Because it's quite difficult to 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 interact with people, but silently. 
Um, and they ended the day at 6 p.m. on that day. All the soldiers kind of came together, so they, they moved throughout the day, their locations. They started off distributed across the country, and they moved together, and they all uh, came together. Well, I think they grouped in different regional cities, not all in one. Um, and they sang a song, We Are Here Because We Are Here, which was a, a song the soldiers sang in the First World War. So there's this a big vocal uh, kind of choral finale to mark the, mark the end of it, and then they're dispersed. I think it's a beautiful, beautiful intervention. Another one which is, um, I'd like to show you, which is one of my favorite interventions by a group called uh, Improv Everywhere, who are a New York group. Um, and they, their intention is to just break up the mundane, repetitive things that we do every day, the kind of, to interrupt uh, our everyday existence, but in a fun and playful way. So they don't want to kind of humiliate or disrupt, but they do, they, they want to uh, make people think in different ways about the space, about how they behave in that space, um, and it's, it is very playful. Sometimes they have a slightly kind of political dimension. They did one in a shop, it's a, a kind of high street electrical shop in New York where the uniform is beige slacks and blue t-shirt, and they got 50 people to do a flash mob who just turn up in beige slacks and 50 t-shirts, blue t-shirts, and just hang around in the shop. Not looking like they work there, but not looking like they're customers, just kind of hanging around. Um, and you know, over time, every, the, the workers start to get really freaked out by these little clones are kind of appearing and why suddenly there's lots of people that look like staff, but they're not staff. Um, they do want, has anyone been to New York in the summer, in August? The subway trains are air conditioning. The subway platforms are not. It is horrendous. You get off a subway train and you feel like you're in a sauna. So what did they do? They turned the platform into a, a kind of sauna, a massage bar. <laughs> so you get off the train, there's people sitting there in towels, and they, there's a bench, and you can have a hot rock treatment um, or a massage. And, um, and people would kind of stop and, and get changed and have a little massage and then go on their way. So they do the, these kind of flash mob things. Um, my favourite one is called Frozen Grand Central Station, and there's a two minute video that documents this intervention. Um, and the way they work is they have a, a, you kind of sign up to be on their mail list, and when they're doing a, a, an intervention, they do a call out, meet at this point, like, a, like any kind of flash mob thing, meet at this time and place, and we'll, then they give them, people are given instructions as to if they need to wear a particular thing. Um, so I'll just play this couple of minute video. Any additions that we're going to be doing today, we're going to be freezing in place on cue at the exact second. We're going to hold that for five minutes, and then we're going to unfreeze again. Then we're going to freeze 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 again. Then we're going to Uh, I need to know. <laughs> 
I love that, that's a sort of dismissive comparison. Um, it's so, so simple. It's one instruction. You stand still for five minutes, you hold that pose, and then you go again. So why, why did it manage to actually interrupt the whole of Grand Central Station? Why did it work? Scale. Yeah. Yeah. Scale. Two people do it, going to have no impact whatsoever. 207 <laughs> agents, three is distributed across the thing. The entire, you know, how busy Grand Central Station is, massive, there are thousands of people going through there all the time, ignoring everything around them because they're the, you know, the busiest, most targeted, you know, <coughs> transient places. Scale. Scale is the thing that works. Something really simple, scaled up. Um, we, you know, we talked about this in relation to some of your projects that they, they work when they're kind of amplified or repeated um, or, or scaled up. But yeah, scale is the one piece. So you don't have to complicate things. The simpler it is, the better it is. Um, the more successful that communication can be. But scale is key. So prior to this, prior to them being able to recruit 207 people on Saturday afternoon in New York, um, they would have started with something small. So they, they started with little interventions, an idea, a seed of an idea, started up with something small and tested it and got feedback and other and got some attention. And so then it slowly grows. So you can so you, you know scaling has to I think for this kind of intervention where because you, you're trying to get buy-in, you're trying to get people to 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 take ownership of the thing that you're trying to do. So it has to be it has to be a kind of iterative process where you start small, you pilot things, you you kind of take the feedback, um, and then you kind of you know, iterate that process. So you know, like a design process is an iterative thing. You start with an idea, you try different things. Some things work, some things don't work. You try again, you try again, but you try to amplify and build up the critical mass. And before you know it, you have a movement. Um, so, you know, all these systems that we've been looking at the last two days from, from nature, the, the, these emergent systems, they have these four components at the heart of them, which is multiple interactions, pattern recognition, feedback loops, and no overarching control. So the slime mold operates in the same way. It's, it's all these cells are interacting through the system. There's, uh, there's you know, kind of, um, kind of interactions and feedback loops constantly within the system. It recognises the patterns. So the pattern recognition in a slime mold is chemical, um, and none of it is in control. And you know, through those those kind of combinations, then it can do things that are far greater than what it should be able to do as just a bunch of cells. Um, an ant colony is the same. There's these feedback loops and mechanisms. So the kind of communications, the, the stigmergic process we're talking about today, are means of communicating and interacting and feedback, feeding back within the system. So, and then yeah, again, no overarching control. It's it's really difficult when you translate to humans because we're rubbish without hierarchy. We are really bad at self-organizing. Can I disagree with that? Yes, of course. <laughs> Please do. So, do you know the work of Otto Scharmer and then some of the people that about self-organization and how, if you look at like a disaster relief, like after a flood, how self-organization is really the most effective means of addressing people's needs, where governments and large bureaucratic structures tend to fail because they don't react immediately, because they have to first do research. While people are drowning, essentially, it's small, self-organized yeah. groups. And so there's a lot of work now done on self-organization. Also in the business setting, that's where Otto Sharma comes in. And he looks at like, um, so uh, uh, say the removal of a managerial class. 
And what would that be for, say, a, a business that does housekeeping or, you know, sends cleaners? If we allowed the cleaners then to decide where they wanted to clean and for how long, that it would actually work much more efficiently, they would be happier, and that it would reduce the cost because we wouldn't have to have managers standing over them and saying we have to go here and there. So there's now yeah. this movement within management and leadership to actually remove hierarchy. Okay, thank you. Any other examples of where hierarchy doesn't work in human systems? Anyone else want to disagree with my statement that we're rubbish at dealing with our hierarchy? I've been in a lot of like student um, city trips or you know, excursion trips and that kind of stuff. And I'm very proactive and I'm not like, I, I'm very like, direct for going from A to B, but I found like we're all there because we want to do the same stuff like discovering design things or an exhibition, but people just people just start like accumulating a plane and it's like, so where do we go? I don't have a plan. <laughs> and then like also it's like to get the groups flowing. It's really like, maybe it's even more motivation when it's actually like a disaster, but when like, people are there just to have fun, sometimes you have to like force them and then they just stay and then it's like, hey guys, we had like, wanted to go there, we had a meeting with this guy. And then we were like asking our professor, can you like say something? He was like, no, like I'm not the guy who like motivates you guys. And that's what I found like, maybe it's the student thing. But sometimes when it's like more about like, hey, you're here because you want to be here and you have the possibility to do stuff, find it quite hard to like get people going. I think it depends on the situation and what the kind of what the need is and what the intention is. So I agree totally with everything you said. Obviously, I believe in non-hierarchical systems. Um, and, you know, and I question why we have hierarchy so entrenched in all aspects of our society. And I think part of the reason we don't um, we don't self-organise is because we're so imposed by, by hierarchies. Um, but there is another factor which is about complexity of, or, of the organism. And I think there's a limit to, to how we could self-organise in the way that these other organisms do because we're far more complex and we have differentiation. So we have different personalities. There are kind of, you know, leaders and followers and instigators and you know, there are different kind of characters within, within our, um, our communities which don't translate as far as we know to these and, and that's and to my um, So I'd like to, I'd like to test a kind of decision-making, non-hierarchical decision-making process. Um, with us, this is this is our finale. <laughs> <laughs> I can feel the bubbling energy in the room. <laughs> <laughs> we have to do a little bit of jumping before we yeah. go out. Yeah. Yeah. So the, this this isn't a, a, a kind of. Um, I'm going to stand up. Let me put stretch. Yes. Okay. Actually, yeah. Could everyone stand up? A simple, a simple instruction that is scaled up because we're now operating as one large group. Um, we are going to place it in the public domain. Um, I would like two observers. Who would like to observe? Okay, okay. And and Alina, has come. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Elena and is it Oclo? Oh, oh. Elko. 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 I had the L and the C and the vowels, but just all in the wrong order. Elko. So Elko and Elena will observe. So your job is to observe our behaviour, but also how, the interruption, how other people respond to what, what we're doing, if they do at all. Um, and our rule that we're going to follow is that we are going to walk, we're going to explore the environment, um, but nobody is leading or following, so we're just going to wander. Um, but there's one rule, two rules, three rules. <laughs> one rule is silence, so it's non-verbal, okay? So no speaking. The second rule is you have to stay visibly in contact with one other part of the cell. So if we imagine that we're all 
individual <coughs> nucleus and a nucleus from the slime mold, but I'm kind of connected in, in an invisible membrane with other nuclei. So we're, we're kind of shuttling nuclei in, in a slime mold, in a human slime mold. Um, but we have to stay visibly in contact with one other person. Which means, if you think how many of us there are, we could distribute quite widely, but you have to stay connected. I don't know what will happen. We might get to a point where we're just stuck because you can't move around a corner if someone is kind of you have to stay connected to them. I don't know. We might we might wander three miles. Um, we might all end up in a very small space. I don't know. We don't going to know what's going to happen. You can make your predictions now, and we can see see what happens. Um, and we're just going to set timers for 15 minutes. And after 15 minutes, we'll come back and discuss. Uh, encounter a, a human human supercell intervention. You up for this? Mm -hmm. Are you up for this? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's go.